All right. Well, uh, welcome again. My name is Vincent Vittori. I'm one of the engineer, software engineer, robotic engineer of the Mahum uh, Meres Technica department, so uh, ocean engineering department. Um, I'll talk today a bit more about uh, two vehicles that we have developed in-house so far. Oh, well, one is done and already in use, and the other one is still in, in development integration phase. But those are our first two um, rock-based vehicles. Um, sorry. So this is the outlook uh, for this presentation today. So very quickly, we're, I'm going to present the fleet of vehicles we already have at Marum to give you an idea of how big the, this research institute is. Then uh, present you very quickly the first, uh, like with some specifications and, and, and background ideas for those two robots, and then we all get a bit of detail about how we use rock uh, within uh, our departments. So the fleet of vehicles, of course, as all ocean engineering uh, institute, we would like, uh, so Mahum also, sorry, I forgot to mention, it's also 90% of scientists. Um, so as all institute, they all would like to have this kind of thing, uh, which is kind of utopic according to me, but uh, but nevertheless, this can show you um, pr in pretty good uh, overview the, some of the vehicles that we already have in-house and that we've already been using for the past 10, 12 years. So we have the broken uh, and bought in our second. One of the cool torpedo shape um, glider kind of rover light so a little bit of background about this Mebo thing those drilling machines the all started with the Amiibo 7. So 7. Or 200 meter of the goal is to go to the seafloor, uh, deploy the legs, stabilize, and then retrieve. Cars. So, um, This container size vehicle at the back of the power is multiple, you don't only deploy it one. You have that for rotate putting arms for different drills. Because now it all fits into one container, so it's easier. And this HRF project, for those who are not very here, thank you. The uh, world, so he the under uh, under ice operations. Right now, you have two types of vehicles. So the ROVs, the remotely operated, it's completely autonomous, battery powered, just a acoustic modem connection you don't really use often because it costs a lot of battery. Mainly the key is that those solutions don't have the, are not equipped for it. Either you have the cable that could get stuck, we'll have for 
it or the right form factor to go and explore all those uh, little areas that those scientists are interested in. That's why we came up with both of, um, the best of both of those worlds together. Uh, so for also some safety reasons, it would be nice to uh, put the research vessel a bit further away from the ice sheet, which is uh, continuously moving as well. Um, start to deploy the vehicle in ROV mode with a cable. Uh, and then depending on the wish of the mission or what could actually happen uh, in general, if the cable gets cut get, uh, or uh, stuck somewhere, you could also decide to cut the, the cable. And then the system will have to switch from a completely operated a state to a completely autonomous state in order to either continue the mission or extract the vehicle out of the, um, uh, out of the ice sheet in order to recover it safely. So very quickly, some specifications. So like I said, it has to be uh, both uh, ROV and AUV worlds put together. So it's going to be battery powered, has the possibility to, get a, to have a cable or not. Um, a little bit faster than an ROV, of course, for some mapping uh, issues. A bit more payload than an AUV because you want to retrieve things with a robotic arm, samples most of the time. And, and the operational weight of around three tons. So it's going to be roughly also a pretty big vehicle. In terms of software specification, I just put the basic here, uh, but I'm going to talk about it a bit more. So we need a system that is able to react to all those environmental, environmental issues. So the cable that gets cut or stuck or other kind of things that could happen underwater. Um, so therefore, we need also an adaptive mission system. Um, this safe switch also we, uh, between the two modes, uh, whether it's voluntary or not and after some software specification in terms of having different layers that handle uh, degrees of uh, importance the task. As well as monitoring, of course, for doing this switching. So this is what the final design should look like in a few months from now, we're hoping. Um, as you can see, it is, sorry, I went a bit too fast. Um, as you can see here, there is eight thrusters, so two vertical ones in the front, one horizontal one, same at the back, with two main thrusters, as well as, which is still in discussion, uh, rudders and elevators. Um, so we have something that is over actuated. And when I say over, it's an understatement. Anyway, this is the final Titan frame, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, last January. Uh, so as you can see, it's a pretty big vehicle. It's roughly six meters long, two meters large, one meter high. Uh, right now, just the frame is about a ton already. Uh, so your car, to give you also some kind of comparison. Uh, we already start to integrate. We have everything ready. Uh, so those are the bottles for the computers and the electronics. Uh, those are the thrusters already mounted. Uh, as you can see, it's also pretty, pretty big thrusters. And these orange things uh, are the buoyancy foam, uh, as well as the hydrodynamic parts of the vehicle. So let's now focus a bit more about rock and the software part. Um, so let's go back a bit and give you some bit of background about Mahu. They told having this uh, seafloor drilling machine uh, that we call Mibo 70. The Great thing about it is that they wanted to have ready as soon as possible. So uh, our software engineer had to come up with something in less than a year, a year roughly, which was too short at the time to start to dig into uh, any kind of existent uh, robotic framework, uh, whether very complex or not. Uh, in the end, this Mibo 70 has been running for the last 12 years. Uh, no, there is no worries about that, but nevertheless, it lacks of those uh, intertype processing, for example, uh, communication interface like Rock could have with Cobalt or, or, or Origin. In 2010, the Maroon uh, signed a partnership with the DFKI regarding this HRF project for the whole 
uh, software part, handling this transition, uh, how we could integrate. So therefore, the choice of a robotic framework became quite obvious at the time. And right after, a year after, they wanted to go bigger and deeper. So in 2011, Mibo 200, and of course, Rock was the quite obvious choice for, for this uh, system as well. Like I said, uh, obvious choice for both. Um, even if Mibo is a quite big machine, it has some simpler software requirements compared to an autonomous vehicle with a lot of different tasks to accomplish. Uh, but nevertheless, we needed a robotic or a framework that was robust enough to be able to handle repetitive tasks, but especially repetitive tasks on a more or less uh, long deployment time. The deployment time could go up to more than a day or two days from time to time. So you need, of course, your software to, to cope with it. For the HROV, more complex software requirement, of course, it's an autonomous vehicle as well as remotely operated with lots of sensors, lots of different devices on it. But nevertheless, we still need a robust system for the number of tasks to accomplish and the different mode of operation as well as, once again, this very important transition between the two. So now let's talk about our use of rock. There's one big thing that you have to see uh, coming from us is that we've been doing a lot of uh, mission at sea, so in the ocean, deep ocean, so up into 3,000 meter diff, new record last month, uh, for the past 12 years. And so when I say static over dynamic, I, I want to mention uh, a static layout, so you're never changing your input output. Uh, all your system stays as it is at the first uh, at the first moment you're running your system, as well as the state of the task. When I mean when I mean state of the task, that you're not stopping them to restarting them, or at least you're trying not to as much as possible. Once again, um, and then like I said, this operational make us believe that a static system is what we want to go for because that's why we feel comfortable confident with it, and, and also because that's what enabled us to accomplish as many missions uh, so far with great success. This is to give you a quick overview of the Mibo architecture. So like I told you earlier, it's a vehicle that doesn't need a lot of, uh, I don't want to say attention, but a lot of uh, complex architecture. So those are mainly the main the main task, it's a, our main two task. This is an origin task for those who are familiar with Rock. Um, and then it's just uh, a few number of drivers afterwards. And that's all we need to drive this whole big container sized machine. So yeah, like I said, one main control task, a fair amount of drivers. And then uh, once again, uh, this is going to be a very important point for us. The, that is always GUI control and operator oriented. We have people that are not developers in the control containers on the ship. So we cannot have terminals open, we cannot restart a script because even if we are also on board, we don't want them to do that. We don't want them to put their hands inside this. We just want to give them big buttons on and off and that's basically it. This is a overview of the architect architecture of the HROV. So as you can see, it's bit more complex, a bit bigger. So we're going to probably one day in the future also think about this kit because we're going to reach this 40 <laughs> component limit soon. Yeah, but we're done already. We're over 40. Um, anyway, so just to give you a quick overview, as you can see, it's color coded, shape coded. Uh, so we have a first layer here that we call the general manager. It's basically the decision level, the level zero. Uh, so you can see there is vehicle mode manager. It's a fault response uh, based system. So you basically plan ahead as much as you can, even if you can never plan everything. All the reactions that the system, or, or I mean, all the events that the systems can encounter and all the necessary actions that you have to take into uh, account and, and deal with right after. We'll, at the same level, we put the missions also, the replanning and, and, and online planner. Then you have a second level with what we call the supervisors, which is just a, uh, a layer that just 
gather the information or transmits the comments uh, to the actual uh, layer that does the job, the driver level. You have also something over there, which is the control part. It's not necessarily getting into this uh, classification, but nevertheless, this is mainly the idea of our overview of the, or our layered overview of the, the system. So to give you, a, again, the bullet points here, three different uh, levels. We have also, of course, one class for the that handles the communication in between those, uh, those layers. It's a static layer, once again, just want to emphasize this. Uh, full base respo uh, full response base, uh, table base system, and once again, operator orientated for the moments where we're going to be uh, using it with a cable. So, about ROC, um, since we wanted to have a static system, we had to come up with a few tools uh, in order to still be able to run our system, but having the possibility to watch it, so to speak, uh, as well as helping us to develop the system, uh, whether it's software related or uh, actually operator or related. And the GUI part, like I said, one big thing for us. So to run the system, well, we have a little tool that we call uh, Simple Runner. Uh, it's basically your uh, Ruby script that gathers all the tasks, all the deployments and apply the configurations. Uh, we also have a couple, a couple of uh, options that we could put into there. So for example, even if I said we should never restart a task, that could happen. So it checks for a task if it goes into error mode and then relaunches it. And then the full response table will decide after a while if it does something or not. Uh, then we can also have uh, uh, the, so yeah, it, uh, we, it does the connections of between the tasks, it checks the dependencies, uh, configure, and then run the whole system. It's based on the YAML configuration file. So yeah, very quickly, you have all your deployments over there, then the task, the connections of the task. You can also precise the policy uh, of your data type uh, in between your connections. Uh, and as you can see over there, uh, which configuration you're using, if uh, you want to create dynamic ports out of it. It's also want or not to reset this task if it goes into an error state or not. Uh, it's also very helpful for us because we have a lot of CAN bus uh, installed into the vehicle, so it also helps us to do the whole uh, configuration over there directly. Um, Another thing, like I said, we have this layered architecture, so we needed a, um, yeah, a class that handles all the messaging in between. So it's a string-based protocol, very easy to debug. That's at least our motto. Um, that is used, I put here, between supervising and managing, so the level zero and one, but we're gonna also use it for all the mission planning and all the um, yeah, mission state, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, like Sylvain said earlier, it's uh, Oracle's base. So there's a library, a control task. Both are handling input output. We're doing all the, all the sensor surveillance in the library, so we can uh, unload the main task uh, yeah, and, and its business. Um, yeah, quick overview of the, uh, of the messaging uh, protocol. Uh, you have a task, a target, message type. Uh, a common or common data afterwards if you need to, but most of the time this common data is, is optional, uh, at least for now. That's, I put it here because that's what we're gonna use for the mission part when we're gonna actually um, tell all those uh, controllers, yeah, go to that death uh, with that timeout and everything. So this is the optional part for the mission. Same for the status. Uh, we have different status type, error, alarm, warning, uh, that we're going to be used that that are going to be used after by the full response table um, to support the development very quickly. Uh, we have something that's called Simple Graph. Uh, we didn't invent anything, but we still needed something that shows uh, the connection between our tasks. Uh, so this is a zoomed overview of one of our uh, deployments, so to speak. So you can have um, 
the possibility to, to see uh, your configuration files and the type of your uh, input outputs. And this is to give you an overview of how Messi can become uh, very quickly. Uh, this is only just for the control part, the control loads. Uh, then you have to add all the rest afterwards. We have also a little simulator, uh, which is not gazebo, but it's something that we reused from the Quest ROV. Um, it helped us, of course, to do some, uh, what I call software in the loop, which is not very accurate, but nevertheless. Uh, very helpful for a lot of different reasons. Uh, trainings of all the pilots once we're gonna be done with everything. Uh, but also, right now for us, a lot of testing about the GUI with the actual ROV pilots. So we have a lot of feedback from them directly. Also, we're testing a lot of joystick configuration. Um, and then, of course, even if it's not a real world uh, with real physics inside, we can also already have a feeling of, about how to tune our vehicle. Like I said, it's over-actuated, so we need to have already some kind of feeling before putting in the water. And then in the future, helping us with the fall response table and the mission planning. Um, yeah, this is a quick overview of uh, how it looks like in 3D and our debug interface. Then we have the GUI part. Uh, I would say it's the again, or that's at least where we put the most of work so far, at least. Um, the main idea of our GUI design, or the way we want to use our GUI design, is that we wanted to give uh, some kind of independence of the widget regarding to the task. In the normal way of using ROC, the, the widget and the task are directly connected. Here, we wanted to give some uh, possibilities to actually do some rapid changes, do some easily configurations, and also what we call loading pages. That's uh, our common uh, GUI that I'm gonna show you right after. And once again, uh, but this is more design thing, it's to be ergonomic and, and very operational orientated. For this, we have three different uh, things. The base GUI, the task adapter widget, and the simple GUI. So simple GUI very quick, because I think I'm gonna be short soon. It's a, it's a running tool for the GUI. It just loads everything, uh, Ruby script, uh, like the simple runner you saw earlier for the, for the running of the system. Well, anyway, for the base GUI, uh, it's basically <coughs> two different things. Uh, it's an alarm page and a base window. Inside of those, uh, inside in the base window, you're gonna have the possibility to load multiple pages. This is what's gonna enable uh, us to display everything and then as well as having uh, a common message bar this is what's going to be uh, through every pages the sort of for the operator for the pilot um, is never going to lose track of what's gonna, what can happen in the system uh, the alarm part of course uh, all the messages that could go there uh, whether it's alarm or information as well as for so the base GUI is also handling all the automatic loading of all the pages and um, the data collection dispatch of all the child widgets that are gonna be loaded within. Well, well, that was a bit quick. Didn't handle that. Yeah, this is just what it looks like in, uh, in terms of the UA file before everything gets loaded inside. Uh, so this is information and alarms, and this is the base window GUI. You can see over there the two little arrows that tells you already that there's gonna be a lot of pages uh, that you're gonna be able to switch uh, from one to another. Another thing, so the task adapter widget, this is what gave us the possibility to be, like I said, independent from the, from the task as a, as a GUI point of view. It's just basically something that we put in the middle. And with this task adapter widget, we're able to, like I said, configure everything and, and, in, and very quickly change the layout of our GUI without having to change anything into our task or our code on that side. So for this, um, I thought the best way to show you was to, uh, to give you an example of how to create a task adapter GUI. So first of all, you have to design your UE file. In the Q We're using Qt. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. So first of all, you need, you need to design your UE file with all the naming and everything that goes accordingly. Then you have this 
uh, adapter widget, which is no more, no less than the normal widget thing that you normally create with Rock. But here, in this case, you just change what I called, what we call uh, output mapping and input mapping. This is what you find in the Ruby uh, script that you have to normally, uh, in order to connect your, uh, your GUI items, your GUI widget, and the, um, the related um, actions, and as well as defining uh, the slots and the, and the signals. Then you have to add this uh, new adapter widget that you created to this uh, widget collection, so which is uh, the main file that uh, collects, as it says, uh, all those uh, adapters in order to run them uh, and configure them at the same time with our little simple GUI tool. Um, you have to define the connection policies. So here you don't see uh, anything specific with the thruster feedback, but here at the bottom you can see that whenever you have a specific type, uh, because it's uh, dependent of your hardware, for example, then that's where you, you, you define it for, for, for your GUI and because that's where it comes from for your system. Um, this is another Ruby script that is launched by the simple GUI as well that does the connection between ports and signals uh, of the GUI and as well as defining the, the getter functions for it. And this is where the magic happens. Um, so this is, as you remember, as I showed you earlier, the window page, the base window page. On there, you actually load all the task adapters that you created. And afterwards, what you can do is directly within the Qt creator, the Qt designer, you can give the task name which is uh, related to which is gonna actually be connected to. And then, so you can see here the output and input mapping, so the one you put into your code. And you can actually, so here there's only one example, but you, that's where you do the configuration, so to speak, easily. And by just removing or putting another task adapter widget, that's what gave us this very great flexibility into our, our, our design. So like I said earlier, the simple uh, GUI uh, I told you about, the, the, the Ruby script that logs everything, connects and reconnects, so you can launch your simple GUI and then launch your system after. It's not a problem, it all, it's gonna detect that and does the uh, according connect connections. Uh, and also as uh, yeah, debugging and, and loading different style sheets because you have to work at night sometimes, so you maybe wanna change your, your GUI style in order to still be able to to work the whole night. Um, this is a quick example of uh, what the actual uh, GUI of the Mibo 200 looks like. Well, uh, sorry about the non-Germanic here, but that's a German institute. Uh, yeah, nothing very uh, fancy, huh? it's QT, but what you have to see here is this, those two here, those two lines here, which are the pages that you basically, you, most of the time it's a touch screen, so you basically uh, press the buttons and then switch the according page. Uh, and then the common message part. Mm. Once again here, another page, the magazine page for instance, but with the same base interface. This is uh, the interface for the HRAF, the pilot page, uh, which is, hasn't been officially validated by the pilots, but soon I hope. Uh, once again, you can see it's, second, it's a different vehicle, different purposes, but nevertheless, we have the same base GUI with the pages and the messaging. Uh, yeah, another page uh, here for the thrusters. And here, I didn't show it for the Amiibo, but it still also has this info alarm page where you can see all the states of all your running tasks. Uh, so that's basically uh, what replaced Rock Display uh, without the dynamic access. Um, but here you can see all your running tasks, their states, and of course the, their preview states uh, since the first launch of the script. Yeah, uh, this is, comes to the end of my presentation. Doing that, we are so far, for now, uh, using static layout. So. Like I said, that's what we are, that 
we're thinking that's the best way for us, at least, to go for right now because of our previous experience. But maybe we will see in the future with the first test of the air truck, we will need to go for a syskit version, maybe. Uh, I hope the transition will be easy. Uh, like I said, uh, multi-layer architecture. We have this translayer messaging capabilities. We are also very focused on the GUI part, so for end users, um, and because they're of their needs and requirements, because they're also coming to us and asking us not to do too many or too fancy stuff, uh, as well as this little simulator thing that's really helping us, because right now we cannot run our system, we're integrating everything, so that's what's helping us to at least run a bit or um, a few tests uh, so far, as well as in the future training for the future pilots, which is already something that is uh, used for the ROV that we have um, at Mount. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for your presentation, and yeah, if you have any questions, feel free. Maybe if you want, in the meantime, if you have some questions, I can show you a video if the Wi-Fi is nice with us about the Mebo, so you can actually realize how big this thing is and actually how big the, the not the maintenance, but the, the, the whole deployment on the research vessel across the world uh, is. Yeah. Yes. Pretty cool. Thank you. You have to thank uh, Jens, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I want to ask, like, how do you the device that operator has on the boat? You say it's a touch screen, or it has no? It, it depends. I think for me, it's not a touch screen. For, for the me, it's not a touch screen. Yeah. For the ROV, it's probably. For the, for, uh, at least for the ROV, it is right now. So, okay. it's probably going to be a touch screen now as well afterwards. Or at least that's the main idea behind the GUI design for the air truck. You said you like spend a lot of time uh, on user interface, but that's like the most important part because it makes the operator view feel like swell. Mm -hmm. um, can you show some of the paths? Like, I would expect like to have it like next to for events or like what problems come up and stuff. That's pretty standard, right? Yes. Sorry, you said? You, you couldn't reuse that from, from another project? Nobody shared that before? Well, that's the thing. This is the first project we're developing from it. I don't know if we... With Rock. With Rock. Not because uh, Zita here present. She was the one doing the Mebo 70 software. Um, but I don't know. We didn't really... I, I think at the beginning... I was not there at the beginning. They started the project a year or two before I arrived. Uh, I don't think they, they wanted to go for other existing things since they knew, for instance, their own needs at the beginning. So like you said, it's pretty standard. Everybody needs it, that's for sure. Uh, but we still never, nevertheless needed to develop it for us, at least the way they wanted to have it or the operators wanted to have it. Because I think that they all had a very precise idea about what they wanted at the time. Yeah, but at the, at the same time, I agree with you in terms of like the interface and uh, having to something that you can use already. But I think the really the main idea was also at the same time we're having also our own needs in terms of like how we wanted to bring the system and how we wanted to develop the whole system in terms of GUI interfacing or, or GUI development. And right now, because this whole thing is already, so to speak, working, uh, then it, it, it pretty much give you like not even half a day of work to integrate a new widget like that. And there are two big projects using it, using it, uh, the base GUI or the GUI uh, against the Galaxy, Galaxy and Versus, which is basically 
And, and we also have more projects coming soon, so we're hoping that we can also... <laughs> I'm not in position to say what I can share now. I'm not, I don't see I don't see the big deal out of it because the ones that want to build a drilling machine, well, the next one who wants to build a drilling machine has to yeah, you know, get you up early. Like the, you have these dimming controls with set points and everything. Um, it's it's really quite it's maybe a day of work, but it's tough to add if you have a lot of pages. No, for sure. There's more than one person in the world that has many. No, for sure. We could definitely. Yeah, we'll see. So and the gen general idea is that uh, if you do share this, uh, you also get to see other people. Yeah, we get feedback and improvements, yeah. Improvement. I mean, I'm not against it. I'm just yeah. not in position to say we can do it. <laughs>